Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to this week's episode of Bruins Tape to Tape. This week, we're coming to you live and in color for the first time ever as we start to expand uh, the Bruins Tape to Tape universe <laughs> into the video world. So if you're not watching us on YouTube, you're missing out. Uh, but this week, we're recording episode 30. It's uh, Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. And I'm here with my fabulous co-host, Maria. Hi, Maria. How are you? Hi, Caroline. It's um, it's a little, little unsettling here seeing myself on video, and I'm not sure how many of our listeners are going to enjoy the view, but, um, you know, we'll give it a shot. Why not, right? Uh, so we've got a ton to talk about this week, so we'll dive right in. We've finally completed our 82 game slog of a season this week. Uh, it was an exciting end to the regular season across the league. I don't know about you, but this had to be the most exciting uh, end to the, at least for the Eastern Conference, uh, the famously called Doodlebug Race. For the final two slots for the uh, wild card, I mean, I remember last year it was a little bit of a doodlebug race, but this year it seemed even more exciting because it was between like three teams and it was literally coming down to the wire and teams didn't know if they were eliminated in the moment and doing crazy things out on the ice. So I was excited. I don't know about you. What did you think? <laughs> uh, you know, it this, this has been by far probably one of the um, most fun end of the season non-Bruins yeah. race loved- that, that I've experienced. But, it, you know, it speaks to the, the parity in the league um, and, and it speaks to, you know, the significance of teams wanting to get in to the Stanley mm-hmm. Cup playoffs because it is the greatest trophy in all of sports and it's the hardest trophy to win in all of sports but it was it was almost like juggling a hot potato because you know from, from it. it wasn't even like week to week it, it's been from one game to the next yeah like just when you thought you know one team was getting a bit of separation then another team would come around and say yeah you think so yeah no no we want to get in too so get the hell out of our way um, so it's it's been loads of fun. It has. I honestly don't remember, you know, you talk about the parody in the league. I don't remember it being like this ever. I think, it. you know, I could be wrong. There could have been a stretch of time. But this was probably the most well-balanced season, or at least with the most number of teams that had a legitimate shot at getting into the playoffs and performing pretty well. I mean, it just makes for exciting hockey no matter what, right? Like, and that's what the league is trying to accomplish. So hooray, they finally got something right. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, even with the top tier teams, you know, that, you know, I'm making, you know, put the the core of of the playoffs. There Mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot separating those teams either. You know, I mean, New York Rangers won the president's trophy. And yeah. they can gladly have that trophy and Bring all it. of it to hell. all of all that comes uh, comes with it. But yeah. you know, even from, from the drop of the puck to the end of the season, you know, there that the, the Bruins were there at one point in time at the top of the league standings Vancouver. for a while. The Vancouver Canucks were there, Winnipeg. you know, Avalanche had their opportunity exactly. there too. So again, I, I if if you're, you know, an owner or, you know, league management or a commissioner, you know, as much as I hate to say, give yourselves a pat on the back. I've got to say, give yourselves a pat on the back. Yep. We are uh, sad to say that, but yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't like giving Mr. Bettman <laughs> no. credit for much of anything, but no. in the, no, in but this instance. Exactly. Even to your point, if you think about from last year to this year, I mean, last year, the Bruins clinched the president's trophy a lot earlier than the Rangers 
clinched the president's trophy themselves. I think actually they only clinched it in what by game 79, 80, 81. Like it was, it was just recently. No, I mean, we're talking like maybe last week. Yeah. Or this week. Right. Right. Exactly. As opposed to last year when the Brewers just ran away with it. And I think they clinched it in like March or something. It was ridiculous. Uh, But very glad to not be near that whatsoever. Um, But that being said, like, yes, there are games happening tonight. It feels weird. We're all done. There are a couple of other teams wrapping everything up. Playoffs uh, officially start on Saturday, which is very exciting. Uh, And going into the excitingness of that final stretch, we had a special episode where we talked about our all of our predictions for the final 10 games and the Bruins exceeded expectations I think for the most part at least mine um you know I had them at 3-3 three, three, and 4 um and they finished 6 and 10 so you know did they kind of stink the last two games yeah they stank okay We've seen them do this before, Uh, but on the whole, for the final 10 games, not only did they have a winning record of six and four, a lot of the other, what I would consider stronger teams going into the playoffs, didn't really have any better records, and they, when they were dominant, they were incredibly dominant, and those last couple of games, do they really matter? No. And we know what it, they're capable of, right? In, in my mind, in my mind, they, they don't. And what I've learned over probably throughout the course of doing this podcast mm-hmm. with you is to try not to base my assessment of the hockey team only with what I saw recently. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we have been watching games. We take notes because we want to talk as informatively as, as we can. And so you look at games now, or at least I do with a little bit of a different, a different lens. Now the game against the capitals. Yes. Could they have put forth a better effort? But again, they're playing a team who has a lot more at stake than you did. And it's not as if they were blown out. They yeah. lost three to two. They lost three to two and they faced yeah. a goalie who played extremely, extremely well. Now, mm-hmm. your goalie had to play extremely well to keep you in that game, yeah. which to me is a good a good sign mm-hmm. because you know, we had had some um, question marks about yeah. Jeremy Swayman since uh-huh. the All-Star break or maybe a little bit after the All-Star break. Right. Um, you know, so, yes, would, would you have liked to see them win out? But when I look at the standings and game records for other teams that are in the playoffs, right. they're not doing anything really vastly different than the Boston Bruins are exactly particularly the team that they're going to face in the playoffs (laughs) on Saturday night at eight o'clock folks I would like to point out a a, a recent discovery that I made literally last night Uh, a couple of days ago the Colorado Avalanche lost to the Winnipeg Jets seven to nothing so keep that in the back of your mind right but I, I'll I'll make you into a data analyst one of these days, Marie. I'm very proud. I know. You, you, you keep it. trying. You keep trying. <laughs> Two games is a terrible sample size. You know we've seen how well they they perform, and we've talked about it on this podcast a ton of times about the psychological aspects of the game. And you know it's not that I want to say like oh they didn't care because certainly you know as 
friend of the pod, part of our Discord group. Everyone should come and join the Discord group. But Jesse had pointed out, you know, it's not, it didn't clearly didn't look like in last night's game that they didn't care. Because looking at Brad Marshan, like you could tell that they still cared. What I mean is it's really hard when you are if there's even a, a tiny sliver of like checking out, it can be so hard to fight that, right? Like if you've ever been in a job or or you've been doing something and you're like, I'm I'm checked out. Like I'm ready for the next thing. Like I'm here, I'm engaged. Like, yes, I want to do well, but you can't sometimes fight that mental checkout, right? And I, you know, yes, there's talk of like, oh, you you want to be in, in control of who you're going to play in the first round. Honestly, maybe they wanted to play Toronto. <laughs> maybe, you know, you never know the power of the mind. You may tell yourself like, oh, no, the division title is important. But man, we really wiped the floor with Toronto this season and be great if we could play them. <laughs> Who knows, right? And, and listen, if if that's what fuels them, if that's what motivates them, mm -hmm. I'm I'm fine with that. But yeah. you know the 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 rationale or the mentality um, of of some who are saying, well, they wanted to lose so that they did play. No, nobody wants to lose. Nobody no professional an athlete sets right. out to want to lose, right? Mm -hmm. And in that third period against Ottawa last night. The Bruins did not want to lose. No. They they threw at least 25 shots. Yeah. On goal. Amazing. At at yeah. the Senators goalie. And and they weren't they weren't, you know, just boinky shots for lack of a better word. They right. they they finally came to their senses after two periods and I think the game against Washington and went back to basics yes get the puck in there dig it out play hard to the net play to the whistle get bodies in front of the net crash the net all of that you know hockey 101 vocabulary yeah. but it nearly paid off in getting them back into that game and yeah. so my takeaway is i left feeling right mm -hmm. better about the fact that they know what they need to do. Yeah. They clearly have the ability and the talent to do it. Mm -hmm. And this team, this Boston Bruins team, has shown us throughout the course of this season pretty much consistently that they can beat really good teams in this league. Yes, 100%. I completely agree with you. Um, you know, it's it's hard to not focus on some of the more frustrating parts, right? You of know, course. I get it. I'm right there with you. I'm equally frustrated. But I, as much as I hate the cliche, playoffs are a completely different beast. You know, it's not a one-game thing. Your focus and your energy are very different. So I'm, uh, I'm not particularly concerned. Um, I would say, let's see what game one is like, you know, I'm not saying that, uh, I have zero concerns. Like, obviously we've spent an entire season at this point talking about some things many, many times. Uh, they're not going to change. So it's, but how they respond in the moment, like the pressure is different. The stakes are higher and who they're playing against matters. We've talked about it. I think ad nauseum that Boston has at least this season and I've seen it in previous recent seasons, right? So this is not specific to this particular um, current leadership or this particular coaching staff the constant playing down to the less great teams mm. and rising to the challenge of the really good teams right so i don't think and this is again my kind of 
hot take, I guess. I don't think that seeing Boston play poorly or not to the standard that we would like to see them play against a team like Washington, like Ottawa, means something truly because look at how they played against Carolina. Look at how they play. They've played against Toronto all season. Look how they've played against Dallas. Look how they've played against uh, Nashville. Like those are the teams that I care about and how they can play against them. Cause those are the teams that scare me. Like Carolina scares the hell out of me. And I hope we don't see them. New York I'm with makes you. I'm me the nervous. <laughs> they mm-hmm. make me nervous. Right. And you also get a seven game series, right? So there are chances. So I don't know. I'm the cautious lap, cautiously optimistic type. And, you know, valid questions have been asked. A uh, friend of the pod, part of our discord group, Shaz has asked some really good questions lately and she's not the only one, you know, uh, I text with my dad during every single game And he brings up the same things. And like, I think, and this is again, my interpretation, like a lot of Bruins fans who have experienced both the highs and the lows of being a Boston Bruin fan. Sometimes when you see them perform at this high level and then also kind of lay these eggs, you kind of question like, well, what the heck is going on in that room, right? What's going on with the leadership? For me, and maybe this is me kind of being a bit of a homer or a big Martian fan willing to forgive some more sins, but I, I'm i not worried about the leadership. And I'll tell you why. It's the definition of leadership is different from person to person, right? Like, don't forget who was captain when they lost in 2013 and in 2019. It wasn't Brad Marchand, right? Who was captain when they couldn't get it together after the first round against Florida? It wasn't Brad Marchand, right? So just because in a game, you can't get the team turned around doesn't mean that there isn't good leadership. And how a person leads is very specific to the person and and their particular core values, right? So we know the core values of leadership for Zidane Chara, right? Through the, the service and the strength and that kind of leadership. And we know through uh, Patrice Bergeron seeing like, you know, uh, again, more of a, a softer side of leadership, you know, that kind of being connected. Marshy is Marshy and he leads in a very different way. You know, he leads by doing with the expectation that others will follow. And there are pros and cons to all of these different kinds of leadership, right? Like, you know, why did they fail to go all the way in 2013 and 2019? And why did they fall short last season? You know, there are a multitude of reasons. It's it's It doesn't all just 100% fall on leadership, just like it doesn't all 100% fall on coaching, right? It is a team and all the pieces have to be working together and they all have to be working in the same direction and they have to all be on the same page. And every single year, that composition of what that team is, is going to be different And some years it's the right mix and some years it's not. So, you know, that's kind of my interpretation of the leadership question. I know I've heard lots of people say, you know, out in the internet world and even my own dad, like, what's up with Marshy and was he really the right choice? And it's just hard because he's not the same. He's not the same person. He's not the same type of leader you can't compare the two and you have to recognize that all of these leadership styles have pros and cons. And I don't think it's fair to necessarily pin any kind of failures on 
the leadership core, those three guys, when we've seen them perform tremendously this season, like their best games have been some of the best games I've ever seen. And sometimes they lose, but they also still finished pretty high up. So I don't, for a season that was supposed to be a wash, I don't, I don't really know how to then respond. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, (laughs) I don't want to invalidate the question that is asked about, you know, leadership and the impact that it does or doesn't have with regard to wins and losses. You know, my view is if Cam Neely is standing up there and telling me that Brad Marchand Mm -hmm. was the right choice to lead this team, then that's all I need. That yeah. that's all I need. Now, yep. you know, you you play as a team, you win as a team, you lose as a team, mm-hmm. right? And so, I've what I think happens sometimes is that we have a tendency to put the burden of success that wasn't accomplished by another group of players or leaders Mm. onto this year's team. I think we've all still have some, (laughs) a bit of a bitter taste in our mouths after what happened last season. And so it's, you know, somewhat understandable, someone somewhat natural to think that you know if if this team doesn't perform to whatever expectations we have mm-hmm. set for them then you you know you need to what i call divvy up the blame blame pie right there yeah. somebody has to be held accountable somebody has to be held responsible and Th- this team, sh- this this current Bruins team, shouldn't have to bear the burden of mm-hmm. what happened to last season's team. Yeah, with that historical run that they had, and then being eliminated. If if anything, if anything, what I hope that that the remainder of that leadership that was part of that learned from that is you know to have the perseverance have the composure have the will yep to to play just play a full 60 minutes play your game play it to the best of your ability Mm -hmm. yeah but just play that full 60 minutes and I think you make an excellent point in, in bringing in last season's team because one of the things we've heard. Discussed, we can't keep blaming these guys, this current team, no. right? Or no, should we, for what happened last season? Yeah. But one of the points that I I really haven't heard mentioned very frequently, I've heard it a couple of times, but the fact, like the, the biggest difference between this team and last year's team is the fact that this year's team has experienced adversity and they've come back from it and they've been knocked down by it and they've come back from it and they come back from it every single time. And there's value in that. And it helps the team not take things maybe for granted. Um, and there are a lot of guys on this team who experienced last year their disappointing first round exit. And I think that that's definitely fuel for the fire. And, you know, speaking of the first round, they released the schedule, I believe you said this morning, very, very recently for the for the um, the Eastern Conference. And I got to tell you, I am so excited the way that everything kind of shook out, I think the fact that the Bruins finished then second in the division actually is to their advantage because whether or not you perceive 
their final two games as, you know, I don't know, a negative, which like, you know, it was not positive, but you know, it, that it was a sign of terrible things to come. I like to call it a lukewarm finish. Yes. Okay. It was lukewarm. I, it's whatever, but nothing right? to panic about uh, in my view, yeah. in my view. But I think it actually served us really, really well because I think the Bruins facing Toronto in the first round actually could be the very best thing to launch them maybe a little bit further into the playoffs than they would have if they were up against Toronto, uh, Tampa Bay. And not because like, oh, Tampa Bay is a harder team to play against. Like Toronto is not a it's not a walk in the park by any no, means. Like none of these, these respects, listen, like, no playoff team is a walk no. in the park. Okay. This is going to be a slog fest. Absolutely. But I think all of the things about the Toronto matchup, like there's multiple things that I think could really inject a ton of life and energy into the Bruins, you know, first and foremost, like remember playoff travel is, brutal and the last couple of years you know last year they were flying out to Miami I think was it the year before was Carolina so that's still also a little bit of a a bit of a flight Toronto's like an less than an hour away by flight right so it's very close which is great for travel recovery it's a massive rivalry which always brings in a ton of energy the games against Toronto this season have been very exciting hockey games. Very physical too. Very very physical physical. games. It's and and the crowd, both no matter where the games are being held, whether they're in Toronto or in Boston, like the crowds are going to be going nuts. And the energy in a in a ring in an arena is gonna is gonna go right on into the game. You know, so I think this is going to be actually one of the best things for the Bruins. You know, no matter what happens, no matter how things turn out, I'm thrilled. I wanted them to finish second because I wanted them to play the Leafs, (laughs) you know. And, hey, we all remember the last time they played the, the Leafs in the first round and how that turned out for us. And, you know, not that. The past and other teams' uh, histories are predictors of the future. I would love to remind everyone, uh, as I was recently reminded, uh, I watched uh, the fantastic documentary on ESPN uh, called Unrivaled between the rivalry between uh, Colorado and Detroit from the fight at the Friday night fight at the Joe when they had that all out brawl. The um, 1996 Detroit Red Wings at the time set the record for the most wins in NHL history with 62, captured the President's Trophy, and did not go all the way. And what did the 1997 Red Wings do? (laughs) It went all the way. (laughs) So you never know (laughs) what's going to happen. So that's all I got to say and, about and that. And just to make just to make our listeners and and fellow Bruins fans feel a little bit better, who do you think is really really worried right now about this matchup? The fan base in Toronto is not going to be able to sleep very much at all mm-hmm. during this series. Yep. So, you know, to the degree that that gives you a little bit of comfort just think about how their stomachs Mm -hmm. are feeling right now at the thought of having to face the boston bruins in the first round of the playoffs oh and by the way the bruins have had their number not only this season yep but in a very long and storied number of playoff rounds over the recent years. So, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want everyone to think that I'm, you know, just blowing smoke and up everyone's <laughs> butt and, you know, everything's perfect in Bruins world because 
No, I know it's not perfect in Bruins world, right. but there's, there's a reason why the Boston Bruins were at the top of the standings mm -hmm. throughout yeah. the virtual course of this season. Yeah. It's because they're a good team. Are yeah. they a great team? No. But is there a great team right now? Is is there any team mm -mm. in the playoffs right now that year. you would place a confident bet on in winning the Stanley Cup trophy? Because I no. can't pick one right now. Mm -mm. I think the last time there was a team, it was it was Tampa Bay. And it was not the year that they got swept in the first round, obviously, by the Columbus Blue Jackets, but the following season. The following know, year. 2020 or was that the Kobe? Was that the bubble? It, it may have been. I'm now it's running together. But I would say uh either their first or their second Stanley Cup win, either of those two years. No, I would say only the first year would I say that the that first Stanley Cup winning year, Tampa Bay, was the team that it was just, they blasted through the season, and that was their cup to win. And, you know, again, here's another great example. They got swept in that first round, and they came back with a vengeance, right? So, um, so it's been a while, right? It's been four years. Um, so yeah, it, it's anybody's game, but I'm really excited about this lineup. You know, we've got um, a couple of really great series that I think are going to be very exciting for everybody to watch. You know, the fact that Florida is playing Tampa, fantastic. The league, I think that's good. So that excited. is that so is going great. to be. I mean, all of these Eastern Con and again, mm -hmm. I, I'm focusing on the Eastern Conference because right. you know the the West right now doesn't interest okay, me <laughs> no 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 it, i mean again it, it doesn't interest me right now it's you know no disrespect to those teams because there are some very good teams um obviously that that made that uh, that made the playoffs but yep. you know our focus is on the eastern conference right now mm -hmm. yeah. and so you know yeah. we've we've got the panthers versus the lightning mm -hmm. which you know that should be like I, I can't even imagine the <laughs> the physicality what that series is going to take out of either one of those teams that are able mm -hmm. to to get to get through that. Yep. Then you've got you know an ideal matchup for the league in general, yes. which is the Bruins versus yes. the Toronto. Maple Leafs. Yep. You know, you don't get much better than that, much more iconic nope. than that. Nope. Then we've got the New York Rangers versus the Washington Capitals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the Capitals could pull an upset. They you know, I mean, know. you Never call know. me crazy, but they could pull an upset out yep. there. Yep. Because, you know, there's been some speculation about the New York Rangers mm -hmm. and you know, yes, they won the president's trophy, right? But in a lot of instances that mm. this season, they beat up on quote unquote lesser teams, but struggled mm. against, you know, the good, good ones, more yeah. Yeah. prolific teams in the yeah. league, for lack of a better word. Right. And then we've got the, um, Carolina Hurricanes versus the New York Islanders. And I so want the Islanders to beat yeah. the Hurricanes. That's, be that's going to be brutal. Because I can't, I can't stomach the thought of looking at Rob Brindamore's oh. face oh. while he's consistently barking and bitching oh. at the referees. I know. Well, and if our, and if our listeners and viewers remember last season... Carolina eliminated uh, the Islanders from the playoffs. So the last playoff team that the Islanders played was Carolina. So while I think a Rangers Islanders matchup would also be iconic because we've got, then we'd have three 
I think this matchup is also pretty fantastic because of what happened in the playoffs uh, between these two teams last year. So it's just going to be super fun. There's going to be a ton of hockey, like first round and second round. It's honestly the best time because there's phenomenal hockey every single night. Uh, As you get further into the playoffs, then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, there's a day where there's like literally no hockey on TV. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, but you know, now it just, it goes up that whole other level. Um, and it's just super exciting. Um, man, we are still setting the table. We've got so much to talk about. We this have week. so much to talk about. We haven't even like, we haven't even taken a deep dive into the actual matchup, know. you know, between the Bruins and the Leafs. And, you know, again, I, know. I don't know how deeply we want to go into the weeds with that. Maybe just, you know, focus on the strengths and yeah. weaknesses of both teams and where yeah. now, well, again, every, everybody knows, you know, the Bruins won the regular season series right. against the Maple Leafs, mm -hmm. but the Maple Leafs still present and pose a very yeah. formidable threat to the Boston Bruins For sure. because, you know, when you look up and down their roster, like, look, Aust Austin Matthews, he, 69 goals. He could yep. potentially hit 70 goals yeah. tonight. All right. Yep. Generational, generational mm -hmm. talent. They've, they've got three good, steady, solid lines. And so, you know, five on five scoring is something to be a little bit concerned about. Mm -hmm. You don't want to give them many power play opportunities, mm -hmm. even though the Boston Bruins have one of the better penalty kill units and mm -hmm. penalty kill statistics in the league. Yep. Mm -hmm. You still don't want to get, they've got too much firepower there where yeah. I think the Maple Leafs still have a weakness and that we have a strength in, mm -hmm. in more than one instance is goaltending. Yes, indeedy. And as I was and, always thought, goalies win cups. <laughs> defense wins championships. We've said that more than once. And Jeremy, and this is going to bring up an interesting question. Because yeah. Jeremy Swayman's stats in the games that he's played virtually, and again, he's got a young career, but his career against the Maple Leafs, the numbers are crazy, folks. Absurd. Absurd, oh, absurd. numbers. <laughs> a, like a, a, a yeah. save percentage that's like almost un unheard of. Yeah. So here we go with let the goalie controversy begin where the Boston Bruins are concerned. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we've we've gone back and forth about, you know, which goaltender should get game one based on, mm -hmm. you know, the levels of their performance because they've been sharing these duties. So we've seen them equally throughout the course mm -hmm. of the year. Each of them has suffered, you know, bouts of high and bouts of low. Right. When one right. has suffered a bout of low, the other one has been there. Right. To, to yep. bring the team back up. Exactly. So, and, you know, a couple of weeks ago, or even as early as, you know, last week, I would have said, mm -hmm. oh, no, no, Jer Lena Slomark should be game one starter. Now. Yeah. In this case. In this case, I don't know now. I might start. I don't know who's going to start. Honestly, I don't either. If it were a regular season game, we all know that Jeremy would be on deck for starting. Mm -hmm. It's the playoffs. But he's also pretty much owned the Leafs for quite a while. So... I wouldn't be super surprised if they gave game one to him to start. Why mess with the system? I think we all saw what happened when you do. Goalies are a special breed of 
human. And as superstitious as hockey players are, goalies are even worse. And I, like, I can, I can, I, I buy the argument, like, oh, you got to have Lena start because he's been fire, right? Like, he's been tremendous. If we were playing any other team, I'd say, yeah, all right, give it to Linus. But we're playing the Leafs. <laughs> I, I think it's got to be Jeremy. I think it's got to be Swayman. I, I don't know. I, I, that's. I, I, I would put money on Sway starting game one. Yeah. The, the interesting question will be, mm. what do you do after game one? Are you, are you right. going to maintain your rotation? I think they have to. And I, I think this is where I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you based on, and again, I know I said earlier, we can't blame anything that happens this mm -hmm. year based right. on what happened last year, but I think right. it's no secret mm -hmm. that they, you know, they went away from a system mm -hmm. that worked. They went away from a system that the goalies had become accustomed mm -hmm. to maybe not so much the players, but to some degree, the routine of the players right. knowing, Hey, you know, Linus is going to be in that tonight. And we know we're going to get, you know, sway in that tonight. But for those two specific players who have clearly mm -hmm. in my mind decided that they are a tandem, that they are a duo and that they're going to accomplish the job together. Yeah. Then I say, at least to start, you've, you've got to go with what you've been doing. Now yeah. that doesn't mean that if things go horribly wrong in game one, game two, right? Then you have the option right. of going to another proven goalie who's been yeah. there, done that for you all season long. Yeah, I think the one of the biggest takeaways and the biggest lessons to learn from last year like again we've said you know we cannot hold last year's team to this year's team but there were lessons to be learned yes and i i'm telling you i feel like i am am in like the twilight zone because i distinctly remember this time last year when that was the big question, because this is the first time ever anybody had the audacity to do something different when it came to playoffs, right? Like we always, we revere the playoffs as almost like this sacred time. We are now coming into the most significant and important part of the hockey season and all traditions must be maintained and respected, right? And you would never go against the traditions and everyone is afraid to do anything different. And I just, I, I even remember, I swear to God, I mean, I could be wrong, but I swear to God, an episode of Morning Brew where the conversation had come up where it was, do, do, does Montgomery do the alternate goalie thing or not. And they were saying, well, of course not. It's the playoffs. You pick one goalie and you go. You've got to go with the hot hand, which again, if you had one of these guys, I, listen, but this was not my head, situation. my head is going to explode. If I listen to Boston sports talk radio, as much as I'm devoted and dedicated, because this is going to be a major topic of conversation and my head is going to explode. I'm going nuts it, here. I'm like, you, my head is I going to explode. You got to ride the hot hand. You got to ride the hot hand. Okay. This is not that's a team not what you did that all has season. been. That's right. Right. So why are you bringing this why up now? <laughs> why would you change that now? You're not going into playoffs and all of a sudden changing your lines. You're not going into playoffs and all of a sudden changing your strategy. Like you're not touching any of that. So why on God's green earth would you change your goalie rotation? And I just remember thinking this last year, I'm like, that's insane. And then when he didn't and everything fell apart, I'm like, 
Well, of course it all fell apart. And of course he felt this pressure to, to go against what he was doing all season because there is the pressure to follow the traditions of playoffs, right? Like if hockey is a religion, this is Christmas, people. This is Easter. Like these are the high holy days. I, I don't know what, like you don't go against the tradition. And so it was either, you know, feeling that pressure feeling the pressure from the Boston sports media, because let's be honest, it's a rough place to exist, right? I mean, it's probably really only it's, worse. It can, it can be brutal. It can be brutal. Yeah. It's like number three high pressure situation where everyone's watching you. So I don't necessarily hold the decision to not do the rotation against Monty because Peer pressure is a real thing, but for the love of God, you did what tradition asked of you. It didn't work. I want to see Jeremy Swayman in net on Saturday, and I want to see Linus Allmark in net on Monday. That's what I want to see. Like, if he's committed to saying, you know what? I did what you guys told me to do last year. I did it against my better judgment because I think he made that pretty clear in that that postmortem press conference. I hope he he feels empowered to do it his way this year because like I just don't understand why you would touch. I don't understand why you would touch that. You don't change anything else. Why would you change that? I and think and, and you know and based on some of the things he said, right? He right. It, it he he gives the impression and the perception that that is the way that he's going to go. Mm -hmm. Now, again, he's, he's a head coach. He reserves the right to change his mind. Right. That's, that's, you know, his, you know, his domain to do so. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But I think there are a number of us who are saying Monty, for the love of God, you know, that kind of blew up, blew up in your face last season yeah, along with a couple of other things some miss some other roster miscues mm -hmm. that were made mm -hmm. during that panthers series right yes. let let us not repeat history yeah. because and i was one of the yeah. ones who was very critical of his yeah. decision making during that panthers series and yeah. you know during the course of this season i have had my concerns which yeah. I have voiced mm -hmm. on our mm -hmm. ep podcast episodes about mm -hmm. Monty as, as, as a coach and his, at times his indecisiveness, mm -hmm. you know, to take direct action yeah. when things are veering off course. Yep. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping mm -hmm. at the, w what do you have to lose? Because if, if, you know, yeah. Game exactly. one, game two, things don't go well. Okay, you pull the plug and then you go to plan B. At least at minimum, start swapping them out sooner. Because, you know, I, and part of me wants to see him do this because I am definitely that personality that I like to disrupt tradition sometimes. And hockey is full of a lot of not great traditions and not great things culturally. So if there's an opportunity to rock the boat, I want to see it happen. I want So the way I look at it, he he he's going to get shit on no yeah. matter what he does yeah. if things yeah. don't go well in this in this first round. Mm -hmm. It it it's not going to matter because he's going to get shit on. Mm -hmm. So my view would be, what do you have to lose? What do you, you have to lose? Because you year. tried it one way last season when you, exactly. when you deviated from your quote unquote norm, what have you got to lose? Because no matter what, you're going to hear crit criticism. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm super excited to see what happens. I'm rooting for let's disrupt tradition. Let's do Let's play your game, right? Like you said earlier, play your game. And how do the Boston Bruins play their game? They play their game by alternating their goaltenders, even when one's super hot, right? Like Linus was 
That's that's part of your DNA right now. And that's been operate. And that has been this team's identity all season long. What has been their strongest, most consistent aspect of this Boston Bruins Mm -hmm. team this season? Goaltending, goaltending, goaltending. Not one guy, both guys. Absolutely. Yeah. So I hope. Oh, and by the way, just for a little bit of fun, for everyone who was very aggravated, frustrated about the Bruins loss last night, let me just tell you that the Maple Leafs are right now playing the Tampa Bay Lightning. They're in the third period, folks, and Toronto is losing 6 2 1. one. So you tell me how warm and fuzzy they're going to feel and their fan base is going to feel. So let's put everything into perspective. Big picture. Big picture. I know. I'm so thrilled. I've been keeping an eye on it this whole evening. It's uh, it's unbelievable. And, you know, you want you want to talk about, like, wanting – I wouldn't want to be the coach of the Maple Leafs right now trying to figure out with this score and the way their goaltending has gone the, the, the entirety of the season – who are you going to put in net in this series? Sheldon Keefe lives in a la la land. He probably sees nothing wrong with anything that's going on in front of him. Yeah, he must have rose colored glasses on all the freaking time. The fact of the matter is, right now, uh, with 7 10 left in the third, Tampa has 32 shots on goal and six goals. Maple Leafs six have goals. 30 shots on goal. Yep. Guess what? Goalies matter. It doesn't matter that you have a 69 goal scorer on your team and a generational talent. The other team has a goalie who hasn't even had his best season. He probably came back from back surgery too early. And you're losing six to one with the same. And and, 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 and on the other side of this coin, for the folks, you know, who were saying they think, you know, Tampa Bay might have been a better matchup. Their yeah. five on five scoring is not, you know, oh, not awesome. <laughs> All the goals that Tampa has scored, except one, have been five on five goals. They've had <laughs> one power play goal. So. <laughs> yeah. No, and and Toronto has uh, done very well this season with their five-on-five goal scoring. They were second only to the Colorado Avalanche. So the fact that all of a sudden all those goals came five-on-five, I mean, defense wins cups, goalies win cups. Um, And you know who scored the goal for Toronto? Ryan Reeves of all people. I (laughs) know. I heard he's gotten pretty hot right now, so we'll see. He's gotten better apparently, but we'll 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 be talking a lot. Well, here's here's what I'm looking forward to: (laughs) Pat Maroon on the ice at the same time as Ryan Reeves. That is going to be theater in and of itself, I would think. Okay, the big rig might have a thing or two to say to Mr. Reeves, so. and you know and and getting back you know again you know we're we're we've got so much to cover tonight but you know we're speaking of pat maroon i know i know pat maroon made his debut loved it um against the penguins great effort he looked you know his first shift understandably so against the penguins to me he looked a little um a little sluggish and maybe a little out of sorts but Mm -hmm. He got better with each shift. Yeah. He played, he you know, yeah, played 13 minutes. I mm-hmm. thought he was, you know, there yeah. wasn't a ton of good to take away from that that uh, game against the Capitals game. Yeah. But I thought he was really good in that game against yeah. the Capitals. I understand why he didn't play last night because, again, folks, he's just getting back from – you know, back surgery, back exactly. injury, recently started skating. So, you know, mm-hmm. why why push the envelope in really a, a, a virtual meaningless game? Right. I mean, all I wanted last yeah. night was, you know, I wanted to see a good effort and I wanted everyone to get off the ice in one piece with no injuries. Right. 
Well, and if it were March and he came back, I mean, how many times have we seen a player come in after, uh, you know, surgery or whatever, they'll play a game, but they won't play the back-to-back, right? Like on the one hand, yes, we wanted him probably to have a few more games in to really start to get to know and learn the system and all that stuff. You know, we saw with Peak, it took him at least a week's worth of games, three, four games to really start to kind of get into the rhythm of things. So I was disappointed that he didn't play, but I understood, you know, it makes well, sense. I, 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 this, this guy knows exactly what he needs to do during the Stanley Cup playoffs. Mm-hmm. He's proven it on more than one team. Mm-hmm. I, I think they they that is the main reason they mm-hmm. brought him in. Yes, for his, his experience and his, his physicality. I, yeah. I think he knows the deal. And I think some of that will be, you know, educating some of these younger players mm-hmm. on – the difference between regular season mm-hmm. and now you're, you're, you're starting a new season, but you're playing for the real deal here yeah. at this point. Exactly. And I'm really excited to see him um, bring his, you know, experience with winning, winning three Stanley Cups in a row and being in four Stanley Cup finals in a row. <laughs> So I'm excited. Like as much as I despised the man before he was a Bruin, you know what? He's on our side now. I don't care. I don't I, care because don't care. he's one of us he's now. All is forgiven. All, All is forgiven. forgiven, Pat. You're one of us. You're one of us um, now. You're in the family. It's all and if you, if, if you help us get through round one, I'm buying the pizza. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so the, you know, we could talk about, of course, and I I don't think we really need to go into a ton. Like, you know, we've said all the things that the Bruins have done really well since we last talked, you know, the goaltending has been fantastic. Um, Pat Maroon had a fantastic debut. We finally saw JD get back on the score sheet. Um, we saw some really promising things. And when it comes to what deserves to be in the penalty box, again, nothing brand new. Everything we already know, with the exception of the Michigan goal, which we're not going to talk about that today. We're not going to talk about that today. No, no, no. We're not going to talk about that today. That's a whole other thing. Um, You know. How did I refer to it in our agenda? The stupid Michigan goal. The stupid Michigan goal. (laughs) And, um, you know, one thing that's kind of like, okay, we don't really know what's going on with Carlo. I think, you know, keep in mind, guys were also probably being a little bit cautious or maybe a little less aggressive or a little less engaged because in those final two games, like you really, really don't want to get injured. Washington has guys on their team that have done a number on guys on our team, Mm -hmm. you know, and Carlo, something happened and we don't really know. And uh, according according to Monty, he, yes, he'll be there. He'll be there. He's going to be ready to go. Yeah. So hopefully whatever that was, wasn't very serious. Um, one of the things that we had talked about um, back in February, and we're going to do a super quick run through because I, we promised we would do that on this episode back in February. And we're already almost out of time. But back in February, we handed out our NHL awards to our Boston Bruins. I'm going to run through the list. And Maria, you're going to give me an agree or disagree. And if you have a quick replacement person, give me their name. I will do the same. All right. So back in February, we gave the heart to David Pasternak. Yay or nay? Uh, That's not changing for me. Same. Uh, Lady Bing. So who's out there getting the highest standards, highest level of play? finishing everything we said charlie coyle yeah i'm nay. sticking with that i'm Same. sticking with charlie coyle i mean the the, the guy's been uh, you know he's he's 
exceeded expectations. Completely, completely. Right, uh, and maybe these were the expectations expected of him when he signed them, right, from the right. wild. But right, and he's how many years filled, ago now? Right, right, exactly. yeah. I'm I'm good with that award standing as is. We gave the Vezina to Jeremy Swayman. This is a hard one. I don't know what to do with I this one. I don't know one either. Now. They kind of flip flopped halfway through the season because Swayman right. definitely had the better season, and now it's. Omar, and so. that, right, and he hit a little bit of a lull. I don't know, right? Can we cut the trophy in half? We're gonna cut it in half. We're gonna cut it in half. They both. They're such it. good buddies. It's I'm not. sure that they could arrange a custody agreement for that trophy. You know what? This is our awards show. We can do what we want. We're cutting it in half. I, lo I love Lucy. Uh, <laughs> the Calder. So at the time, we didn't really have one to give out because we didn't really have any particular spectacular. Uh, rookies however i'm going to throw out there instead of the calder for the rookie player to the nhl we're going to give the calder out to the first year guy on the team who has been around the league so our candidates are shaddy geeks braz hino and jvr who are you giving it to so i'm gonna i'm gonna talk out of both sides of my mouth i think if justin brazo hadn't gotten injured I would have given it, I would give it to him mm -hmm. in lieu of that. As much as I was not a fan of this signing and not a fan of this player when he, his first run with the Boston Bruins, I have to say Danton Heinen. Yeah. Uh, I would have said the same thing about Braz. If he was still playing right now, it would be his hands down. And I'm kind of tied between uh, Heino and geeks. Uh, Geeky has had a phenomenal season as well. Um, all right, Norris. So this was one that I said shouldn't be the way that it is. So we split it and we said for the defensive defenseman, AKA the actual Norris trophy, Brandon Carlo. And for the offensive defenseman, AKA the Bobby Orr award, we said Chucky. Thoughts? So I'm going to say something controversial because I'm giving it to one guy and mm -hmm. and maybe I'm too hard on one guy I think I know because I expect more out of him but I'm giving it to Brandon Carlo yeah hands down because my expectations for McAvoy um and and maybe they're maybe I'm being unfair um I you know he's now wearing a letter yep he yeah. I now consider him to be a core mm -hmm. leader of this group and my expectation is when we're talking about that trophy mm. on both ends of it, defense and offense, it should be Charlie McAvoy. Yeah. I'm sticking with Carlo for defensive uh, defenseman and for offensive defenseman. Honestly, I don't want to hand it out to anyone. And my criticism for Chucky isn't, rooted in my expectations of him around his leadership position but just the fact that I feel like this year was just not his year for an offensive presence and as we have kind of speculated in the past I now kind of wonder if much of his offensive prowess as a defenseman came from be playing out on the ice with such a defensive forward in Patrice Bergeron. Ooh. Um, for Masterton, now I was looking through our notes and I could not find for the life of me who you put down for the Masterton. That's the Perseverance Award. Uh, I found mine and I gave it to JD because he was still keeping a good attitude and he was still a playmaker. Oh, you still I'll want to stick it. with that? I want just asking for just asking for a friend. I know. Look, there's still value in the things that he did, but he still didn't quite turn it around in the way that I wanted it to. So I'm going to give it to Hino. Yeah, I agree with you because stuck it out I, and it. and we we you know we we talked about this on a recent pod. Hmm. My, my, my patience for waiting for Jake to put it all together and put yeah. it all together consistently. Yeah. 
yeah. is has about run its course. Yeah. And, you know, I know there's there's always talk about the intangibles yeah. that someone brings. Right. However, at the start at the start of the season, people smarter than you or I said that Jake has got to be in in the 20 plus goals yep. for this team. Has, yeah. Do you do you see it? No. I know. Uh, Case closed. <laughs> Kelsey, we made I made the argument for Marshand. You made the argument for Coil or Zaka. What do you say? I said so none. at that <laughs> I said nobody. I, I nobody. The, nobody. I mean, <laughs> you know both Coil and Zaka have <laughs> I don't want to say struggled. But their face-off percentages have been Not great. a bit on the inconsistent side, right? Yeah. There, there are games where they're lights out, and then there are games where the struggle is, is real. Mm -hmm. But what I will say about those two guys mm -hmm. in, in their defense was when we knew that Bergeron and Krejci were moving on, one of the big yeah. key questions was, you know, how they, how are you going to make up for that point production? Mm -hmm. But Coil yeah. and Zaka have more than made up for that point production. I will take points over a face-off win. And I will, and both those guys have shown mm -hmm. that they can be defensive forwards. Sometimes Zaka, to his own detriment, I think, mm -hmm. where I would rather him be a little bit more focused at times on offense, but yeah. man, he, I think he's going to come up big in this round of the playoffs. The last couple of games, he's been feeling it offensively. He's, he's been all over the net, up and down the ice. Yeah. So I'm, I'm expecting big things from Pavel Zaka yes. in this first round against the Maple Leafs. Agreed. And then for seventh player, I said Coyle, you said Freddie. Interestingly enough, Trent Frederick won the Nesson's and, seventh player. And I'm going to walk that back because yeah. that was based on what we had seen to that yeah. point in the season. Yep. Freddie has gone stone cold Steve Austin. Yep. Stone yeah. cold. And so I'm he's got to get off the schneid. Yeah, he's got to yeah. get off the schneid. Who do you give it to? Now? Yeah. Coil. I'd take it away from yeah. Freddie and give it to Coil. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I I will tell everyone I voted and I voted for uh Charlie Coyle and I would even I voted for Charlie Coyle as well. I but you know what? I was expecting Danton Heinen and I would be fine with it going to either him or Charlie Coyle. Because I think they both exceeded expectations and did went well above and beyond what anyone thought they would do or could do, you know, but all right. So that brings us to the end of our time. I know we've got Just, so much to talk about. We're so excited for the playoffs. We're playing uh, Toronto Maple Leafs this Saturday. Uh, that is the 20th. It's at 8 p.m. At p.m. Um, you can watch I'll be it. in the building. Oh, we're so jealous. It's I'll uh, be in the building. TBS, Max, if you're in Canada, CBC, Hockey Night in Canada game, obviously. I mean, we all knew that was coming. But super big special announcement. Um, and before I actually give the special announcement, again, a hat tip to 20 years, 19 years of announcing by Jack Edwards. It's going to be weird to not have his uh, insanity while we're watching the games, but we're glad that he is uh, leaving on his terms and retiring. And we're excited to see also what comes next. What um, the future brings. And just quickly what I just, you know, people have very strong opinions <laughs> about Jack. Yep. And, you know, maybe it was time. Yep. But what I will say, there's no denying the fact that Jack Edwards was always passionate about the Bruins, mm -hmm. passionate about the sport of hockey, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. always prepared. And for that, he deserves our respect and our thanks. Yep. He loved the Boston Bruins and that's what you want in your hometown play-by-play announcer. Couldn't have, couldn't have had a better person for it. Uh, as much as some of his expressions drove us insane, I will say that Correct. There always still a handful. They had run their course. Easy. Yes, they had run their course. Yes, but you know, in terms of his, <laughs> you know, knowledge of the sport, clearly yeah. his passion about the sport, mm-hmm. his profession, you know, his his dedication to his craft. It's un- that is all undeniable. Absolutely. You can't take that away from him. Absolutely. Uh, and then so our final real special announcement we're going to be having a special episode we're going to be airing it uh, a little bit later this week and we're going to try and also get it out ahead of the game one against the Leafs Um, Maria and I are welcoming to the pod Uh, you may have seen her on TikTok and on Instagram Katie, aka uh, the Gia Cobra. She's uh, a TikTok and Instagram personality who has recently discovered all the wonderful things about the game of hockey. Uh, we'll include all sorts of fun videos from her in our show notes, as well as all the other things. Um, you've probably seen her videos. Um, she talks about the head bonks and the goalie hugs and all the crazy and wild things that she's been learning about the game of hockey since she started watching, I believe, in December. Um, so we're super excited to welcome her to the pod for a special episode. Um, and with that, do you have anything else to add, Maria? I am so looking forward <laughs> to to grooming Katie into a Bruins to Bruins fandom. Let's be honest. That's the whole point, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, as always, uh, the hour has flown by and I'm so excited for playoffs to start. So go bees. Go bees.